Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Jenna and I do something a little bit different here on my channel. So basically I like to do my makeup whilst talking about a true crime case that I am recently interested in. I'm not a makeup artist but I love makeup. I'm not a detective but I love true crime. Put it all together and that is me. So I did a poll on Instagram the other day and I'll put my Instagram on the screen somewhere if you want to go and follow me, check me out, that'd be great, thank you. And people voted for a 1940s case rather than an 1860s case, so 1940s it is, that's what we're doing today. Before I get into the video it would be really really great if you could subscribe to this channel and to give this video a like if you enjoy it because it really does help me out. Right, about time we got on with the video I think. So today's case is about a woman named Leonarda Cianciulli. Now first things first, this case takes place in Italy. There are going to be a lot of words that I mispronounce and yeah, sorry. I will try my best though. Leonardo was born in 1894 to Mother Emilia in Montella, Italy. And at the time, this was one of the poorest regions in Italy. Unfortunately, Leonardo was the product of rape and her father was a man named Mariano Cianciulli. Her mother Emilia was actually forced to marry Mariano um, when people discovered that she was pregnant. Now this is something that it happened a lot back in those days and it also still happens around the world today. Uh, fortunately it doesn't happen in half as many countries as it used to. Leonardo had a fairly rubbish childhood. She lived in extreme poverty and when she was still quite young, her father uh, passed away. And of course, the marriage wouldn't have been a, um, a very loving marriage, considering the circumstances they married in. But, you know, Mariano would have been the main earner. Um, so when he passed away, the, the poverty just got worse for Leonardo, Leonardo and her mother. Leonardo's mother, Amelia, would remarry um, a little while after, but this didn't really do much to you know bring them out of the poverty that they were living in it did something but not a lot Amelia actually emotionally abused Leonardo um, for pretty much her whole childhood she just saw her as a constant reminder of everything that she'd been through so you know the, the rape having to marry her rapist she was just she every time she looked at her that's all she saw she didn't see her child and which is sad and I know a lot of people do have that but you know it didn't make it easy on Leonardo. Now sadly Leonardo was aware of all of this like she was very aware of how her mother felt towards her and you know the situation that she was born into. She actually tried to kill herself twice whilst still a child and obviously she survived these attempts and this made her mother if anything even worse towards her. When Leonardo was at the age of when she could get married, her mother and her stepfather had plans to marry her off to a young gentleman. He was from a more well-off family, so this would give them better financial prospects. Now, Leonardo wasn't having any of it because she had actually fallen in love with a local postal clerk named Raphael Pansardi. The young couple married in 1914 when Leonardo was 20 years old. Leonardo would later go on to say that her mother disapproved of this so much um, and was very upset that she actually placed a curse on the marriage. The newly married couple stayed in Mortella for a few years before moving to Raphael's hometown of Lori. They just felt like they needed to get away now, they needed to leave um, Amelia behind and all her negativity and just start fresh, move somewhere else. Now, going back to when Leonardo was a teenager, she went and visited a fortune teller. This fortune teller told Leonardo that she would marry and have children, but that all of these children would die before her. A little while after this, she would go and see another fortune teller um, who would read her palm and she would say, in your right palm, I see prison and in your left, I see a criminal asylum. Now this combined with her mother's curse, uh, this made Leonardo a very superstitious woman. And she just thought that her life was doomed, basically. I'm not one to really believe in fortune tellers and stuff, but nearly everything they said did come true. 
Over the years, Leonardo would fall pregnant 17 times. Some of these pregnancies would um, end in miscarriage. Some of the babies were stillborn um, and some of the babies wouldn't survive past infancy. Only four of her children would live past childhood. Because of this, um, Leonardo was just very protective of her children and would do anything to keep them safe. She also wanted them to have a good childhood and just to not have the childhood that she had. There's not a lot of information um, of her life in Laurie up until 1927 when she was convicted of fraud and sent to prison. Fortune teller, she was right. What is wrong with this dodgy dry eyelid? Just ignore this mess that is going on with my eyes. I have got a dry eyelid and I don't know why. I am not blessed today. Unfortunately, I couldn't find out what she did, like much about her crime that she committed. We just know that she committed fraud. When she was released, the family decided to move um, because Leonardo was just, you know, a bit embarrassed that she had been in prison. So they wanted a new fresh start. They moved to Macedonia, uh, but unfortunately, a little while after, there was an earthquake and it destroyed their family home. After this, they then moved to a place called Correggio, where they settled quite nicely and Leonardo opened up her own shop. So by this time, Leonardo was a self-proclaimed fortune teller herself, and she would offer these services in her shop. She earned a reputation as a guru of sorts, where she would just give people advice on you know, love, money, anything that they came to her with, she had advice for them. Everyone just kind of loved her in the town. By this point, her husband, Raphael, had turned to alcohol because he couldn't find any work and you know, he couldn't help support the family, so would just drink. Leonardo eventually just had enough of this and she kicked him out. And it's at this point that he disappears from all public records. Now, even though um, Leonardo loved all of her kids, she had a favourite. You know, every parents have their favourite, right? So her son Giuseppe was her favourite child. And this is probably because he was the first of her babies to actually survive. This being said, her worst nightmare came when in World War II, every able-bodied man was drafted to fight against Nazi Germany in the war. Now, Leonardo thought, absolutely not, no way. What am I supposed to do? I can't let my baby die. So she thought, you know, what, what can I do? What can I do to save him? And then Eureka, light bulb moment, human sacrifice, obviously. Off camera, I did some wings. What are these? I don't know what went wrong. Well, a lot went wrong. I don't know, ran out. Not very good at it. Don't know why I did it. Anyway, Leonardo's thinking behind the uh, old human sacrifice is that the sacrifices would take the place of Giuseppe in the afterlife so that they, whoever they are, wouldn't have to take Giuseppe. Now, because she was a trusted um, figure in the community, people, you know, came to her and talked about things to her all the time. So she knew the ins and outs of basically everybody who lived nearby. This made it easy for Leonardo to pick out people that wouldn't really be missed by close friends and family. Leonardo's first victim or sacrifice was 73 year old Faustina Setti. Faustina had never married and she was going to Leonardo for advice on her love life. One day during one of their chats or sessions or whatever you want to call them, Leonardo mentioned a man. She was like, got it, got the man for you. She spoke of a older gentleman who was looking for love in Pola um, and Pola was at the time an Italian province but it's now in modern day Croatia so it was a fair distance away. Leonardo forged uh, many letters to Faustina um, so that she would think you know that he's legit, he's real, this is all good. She would then help Faustina prepare to move uh, she sold her house and everything, um, and all the while this man didn't exist. Leonardo also told Faustina to uh, not tell her family yet, and that she should just write letters and postcards and send them out 
when she gets to Polar. Um, now, from what I can gather in information, it was um, it was so that her family didn't question and talk her out of it because she obviously didn't know this man. So going to Polar um, to be with him when she didn't know him, her family could have talked her out of it quite easily. So Faustina did everything she needed to prepare for her move. Like I said, she sold her home and everything. And on the day of her planned departure, she went to visit Leonardo for one last time. They were just having a chat, like being normal, and Leonardo offered Faustina a glass of wine to celebrate. Little did she know, though, the wine was drugged. Once Faustina had passed out from the drugged wine, um, Leonardo decided to kill her with an axe. She then dragged her to, for, from what I could figure out, dragged her to the bathroom. She then proceeded to cut her body up into nine pieces and drain her blood in the sink. Now, the reason we know all of these details is because uh, Leonardo published her own memoirs later on in life from prison. Um, and she is very, very detailed uh, about exactly what she did. So there's actually a quote that I'm going to read. She says, I threw the pieces into a pot with seven kilos of caustic soda which I had brought to make soap and stirred the mixture until the pieces dissolved into a thick dark mush that I poured into several buckets and emptied into a nearby septic tank. As for the blood in the basin, I waited until it coagulated, dried it in the oven, ground it and mixed it up with flour, sugar, chocolate, milk and eggs, as well as a bit of margarine, kneading all the ingredients together. I made lots of crunchy tea cakes and served them to the ladies who came to visit, though Giuseppe also ate them. So not only did she kill Faustina, she served her remains to customers and to her son. Now, after she had done this, she realised um, that she needed to send the letters from Pola uh, to avoid suspicion. So she sent her youngest son to Pola um, and she sent him on business. And one of these business things was to send letters. Now, as far as we are aware, um, the son didn't know anything, like he didn't know what was going on. He just thought that he was helping out his mother. There are reports that for this move, um, that Faustina paid Leonardo 30,000 lira. And then there were also reports saying that she just, that she just emptied out her savings after she had died. A little while after this, uh, Leonardo decided it was time for another sacrifice, you know, the, got to keep her son safe and everything. The next unsuspecting victim would be 55-year-old Francesca Suave. Francesca was widowed, she was out of work, and she was struggling to make ends meet, so she went to Leonardo for advice. So during one of her tarot card readings, coincidentally, Leonardo informed Francesca of an employment opportunity at a nearby school in Pacenza. Oh God, I think that's how you say it. And that she should go straight away. Francesca, like Faustina before her, made all the necessary steps um, in order to be ready for her move. Like she sold her house and everything. And on the 5th of September 1940, she went to visit Leonardo one last time. Whilst she was at Leonardo's, Francesca wrote letters to her friends and family that would be sent when she was in Piacenza, um, saying that she was happy in her new life, for them to not to worry. Um, yeah, and like I said, these would be sent when she was there. When she was done with these letters, Leonardo offered her a glass of wine. Don't do it, Francesca, don't do it. So again, when the wine had kicked in, and Francesca passed out, Leonardo killed her with an axe and processed her body into soap and tea cakes, just like she did with Faustina. A few weeks later, Francesca's friends and family would receive letters informing them that she was happy in her new life. A couple of weeks later, Leonardo thought, you know what, better be safe than sorry. I think I need another sacrifice. Her next victim was 53-year-old Virginia Cachapo. Oh god, I'm so sorry. 
but this time Leonardo was a bit careless in choosing her victim slash sacrifice because she wasn't like the other two. This woman, she had previously professionally sung. Uh, she was a soprano and sung in a very prestigious place in Milan. Uh, so people knew her, people knew who she was. And even if they didn't know her, you know, personally, they would know, oh, that, that's, the, that's the singer lady. People just knew who she was. Virginia also had close family, which is something that the others didn't have. They had family, but they weren't like really close with them or anything. But Virginia was. So Virginia was looking for work as she could no longer sing professionally. So she went to Leonardo. Leonardo told Virginia that she had spoken to an acquaintance and that he was offering a position at a wealthy man's firm in Florence. He apparently said that the offer wouldn't last very long so that she would have to act quickly. She also told Virginia that she couldn't tell her family and friends because um, that she was having an affair with the man in question and she didn't want to disgrace him if anyone ever found out about the affair. This of course was not true. There was no affair and there was no man. Virginia obviously believed Leonardo, there was no reason for her not to believe her um, and she started to make the preparations in order to move, selling her house, getting her affairs in order, all of that. On the 30th of September 1940, Virginia went to visit Leonardo one last time and unfortunately the same thing that happened to Faustina and Francesca happened to Virginia. Leonardo later wrote in her memoir, she ended up in the pot like the other two. Her flesh was fat and white. When it had melted, I added a bottle of cologne and after a long time on the boil, I was able to make most acceptable creamy soap. I gave bars to neighbours and acquaintances. The cakes too were better. That woman was really sweet. Now in my opinion, that doesn't sound like it's coming from a lady who only killed to save her family or whatever thing she had in her head. That sounds like someone who enjoyed it. Now the, the first murder could have started out as a sacrifice and then maybe she enjoyed it and you know told herself that she needed more sacrifices but actually she just really enjoyed killing people in the end. That's what I think anyway but what do I know? That woman was really sweet. Over the course of the murders Leonardo managed to gain tens of thousands of lira in the form of um, bonds and jewellery and cash and people started to get a little bit suspicious of, you know, how does Leonardo have all of this money all of a sudden? One person in particular though became very suspicious and it's a good job she did really. Virginia's sister-in-law I couldn't find a name for her, so she's just called sister-in-law in this story. Sorry. Well, she said that she had seen Virginia enter Leonardo's house on the day that she had disappeared. She said that she watched the house for two hours, uh, waiting for Virginia to reappear, and she never did. She decided to um, just go up to Leonardo's place and knock on the door, and when she answered there was no sign of Virginia but there was a foul stench coming from a pot that was on the stove in the kitchen. So the sister-in-law came away from the house you know, a little bit confused like I saw her go in but she didn't come out but she just had a really bad feeling so, so she went to the police and told them everything. Now I'm not sure why um, she was staring at the house uh, maybe she was already suspicious of Leonardo, so when she saw uh, Virginia go into the house, maybe she thought, oh, better watch. But anyway, police uh, launched an investigation and they collected um, some evidence, so things like the soap and the tea cakes in her shop that she was selling to her customers. They collected all of this as evidence and then she was arrested shortly after. Now, because this was 1940 and of course World War II was going on, the trial for Leonardo was pushed back six years until 1946. And, you know, for Leonardo's case, it's, it's not that bad really, but can you imagine all of the innocent people 
that were in prison at that time just waiting for a trial and then to probably be released afterwards like oh yeah you're innocent see you later but you would have been waiting for six years that that's awful over the years the police collected you know more and more evidence against leonarda but they were convinced that she had an accomplice and they came to the conclusion that her accomplice must have been one of her sons they thought that it would be absolutely impossible for leonarda to hack up a body and melt it in under two hours by herself they just thought that this was impossible so she had to have an accomplice when leonarda found out that um her son had been accused she she couldn't have this like she was doing all this to protect her family so this is when she finally confessed even when she did confess though police still weren't convinced they still weren't buying it so she actually uh, uh, managed to convince them to take her to the local morgue. It was at the local morgue, and I I don't know how they let her do this, because, hmm, but she managed to, on the dead body, prove that she could indeed uh, hack up a body into nine pieces in just under 12 minutes. The police were absolutely horrified, of, of course, um, but it meant that her son was let go, that he was no longer under suspicion. At her trial, it said that Leonardo came across as just a very kind, normal lady, um, and that she seemed to not really understand that what she had done was wrong. Eventually, she was convicted and sentenced to 30 years in prison, with a further three years in an asylum. Now, what was it the fortune teller said? In your right palm, I see prison, and in your left, I see a criminal asylum. Mm-hmm. She was right. For years, her children didn't actually believe that she had done this. Um, they thought that the police had coerced a confession out of her, um, and they saw their mum as a kind, caring lady, and she couldn't possibly ever do what they're saying that she did. That was until she released her memoirs from prison years later, and it detailed everything um, and it was very detailed too. She died on the 15th of October 1970 in Naples, Italy in prison of a bleed on the brain which is a pretty nasty way to die. So what do we think? Do we think that she was criminally insane? Do we think that she made up the story to get a lesser sentence? I don't know, tell me what you think down below in the comments and also it would be great if you could subscribe and give this video a like if you enjoyed it and let me know if there's anything you want me to cover in the future but for now see you in the next video